So, Chris, how good is your memory? It gets worse as I get older, which I've become aware of, uh, which is kind of frustrating. Um, it's pretty good. I have a pretty good visual memory. Um, but I have a tendency to remember, you know, if I see a film and I remember it six months later, I tend to remember it reversed, as in left to right of, of the frame, which is a sort of peculiarity I've noticed in my memory, which is kind of weird. Um, I, I'm very interested in the process of memory and the way it can be distorted and all the rest. And, and I know that Guy, the same as, as me, in going through making the film, you go through, you, we went through an, an intense process of questioning um, our own memories and the, and the way it works. And I sort of came out the other side very much less confident of, of the way my memory worked than before. And then the script and, and Leonard's systems and, and the way the, the plot points come together relating to memory, they are just extrapolations of the way I try and help my short-term memory myself. You know, I write phone numbers in my hand and I, uh, I take notes and, you know, I have souvenirs of things and I use photography and, and all these different aids to kind of, uh, you know, help me live life. And, and once you start identifying them, um, you start to realize that, that your process of memory is not as good as you, you hoped. And it's much more interpretive than you realized. And one of the things we were trying to do in the film, it, it, by putting people as firmly as possible into Leonard's head, we were really... Uh, trying to, to make the audience question their own process of memory a little bit, the way we did while we were making the film. It's a movie about an investigator who doesn't know anything. That's a pretty interesting idea. Yeah, I, well, I thought so when my brother told it to me. Uh, <laughs> it was uh, based on a, a short story that my brother Jonah was writing uh, that's just been published in Esquire magazine. And he told it to me about uh, three years ago while we were driving from Chicago to Los Angeles. He said, I'm working on this story, and it's about um, this guy with this condition. You know, he, he can't make new memories, and he's uh, looking for revenge. He's looking for the guy who killed his wife. Um, and I just thought it was such a fantastic idea, such a way into the, the film noir genre, a way to kind of reassess some of the, the over-familiar tropes, really. And, um, you know, I, I said to him, well, can I take it and write a screenplay from it while you work on your story, um, you know, and get it the way you want? And uh, he said yes which was lucky because I think it actually it took him as long to finish writing a story as it did for us to finish making the film. <laughs> but he finished it in the end and it, and it turned out great. But it's, it's very different from the, it, the it film. It is very different, but yeah. we talked before about this a little bit and I think there's a similar sense of desperation in both the script or the movie, I guess, and in his story too. Yeah, I think there's a similar sense of desperation. I think there's a, I think the story represents kind of the, the point of origin, kind of the backstory. Uh, for the film in a way. Um, and the other thing that, that Jonah and I collaborated on that, that he really um, created was the, the website for the film, which is at otnamem.com, which is memento, spelled backwards. And he put this website together that, that it doesn't really give any information about the film particularly, but it creates a narrative link between the world of his story and, and the world of the finished film, which I think is kind of interesting. How do you end up describing the film to people who haven't seen it? I mean, what do you say when they say they've heard about it and they want to have you tell them what it is? Sure. Well, uh, I mean, I say it's a psychological thriller about a guy who can't make new memories, who's looking for revenge. And the story is told in as subjective a way as we were able to, to do. We really try to, to put the audience into the head of the protagonist and make them experience some of his confusion and uncertainty and paranoia. But it's weird, too, because it's definitely a film with the most unreliable of unreliable narrators. Right. <laughs> well, I, I've always been interested in, in that particular story element or narrative element, you know, that of, of the unreliable narrator, particularly when you are given very strongly that narrator's point of view um, through the film. Um, but to me, it had always been a problem to come up with the appropriate reason for the, the narrator being unreliable. Because to me, it's never been interesting enough, uh, you know, if, if the guy is just lying or if he's dreaming or, you know, whatever. Um, but in this idea of my brothers, I found a sort of perfect jumping off point to, to explore that, that method of storytelling, that, that idea of seeing the world through this very distorted point of view of, of one particular person. How do you prepare for making a movie like this? Do you see 
movies or the film noirs, you look at Out of the Past or Double Indemnity or something like that just to get yourself sort of centered, or what do you do? No, I try not to um, be too conscious in my influences, um, particularly when working with a, such a specific genre, because I do think the film is a film noir. You know, people sometimes ask me if I think it's a film noir as if I, I would take objection to that, but I don't, you know, I'm very comfortable with that. Um, but I try not to, to, you know, be too conscious about what, what I'm being influenced by. Uh, but when I look back at the film, I see plenty of, plenty of things that I've grown up watching. I mean, you mentioned Double Indemnity, that's certainly a film that there are, you know, things from in, in this film. Um, and I think the film, to a certain extent, is a combination of that kind of material, those kind of tropes and, and um, story elements um, with some of the more experimental narrative and editing rhythms of people like Nicholas Rogue or right back to Orson Welles and people like that. You say Nicholas Rogue, though, and I find myself really thinking of Don't Look Now right. when I see this, especially in the end, which makes it feel kind of like a parable in the way that Don't Look Now is kind of one, too. Yeah, I think it was more with uh, my first film, Following, um, where it was a non-linear structure. Um, people often refer to Memento as having a non-linear structure, but it isn't. It's, it's very linear, more so than a conventional film. You actually can't remove a scene from the film um, because each scene depends on its relationship with the pre preceding scene and the one that follows. It's totally linear. It's just reversed, essentially. Um, so where the, the element of, of time and the distortion of time, I think, comes into it is that in really trying to put the audience into uh, Leonard's mindset, you sort of enter into his confusion as to the sequence of events and also as to the overall time period that the film is taking place in. Uh, it seems to be a film that's very difficult for people to figure out what the, the time that's passed over the, the length of the story, you know, what time period it is, whether it's a couple of days or weeks or, or whatever. Um, and to me, that was entirely appropriate because the, when I looked into the, the real life condition, um, that is very much a feature of it in real life. When somebody loses the ability to process information in the conventional way, when they lose the ability to, you know, take the experience, you know, we're having now and then pass that into the long term memory, they get very bad and in the end cease to be able to. to estimate time and estimate the time that's passed. Um, so in the story, the, we make a big feature, I mean, of the notion that he does not know how long it is since receiving his head injury, um, you know, receiving the, the, the injury that, that means that he's stopped making memories and the point at which we're seeing the story. That's a very indeterminate period of time, which was always very interesting to me. Sounds like kind of a dangerous thing to do too, though, I mean, because if audiences are trying to keep a sense of how much time has passed while he's working this out, it can get, it can compound a confusion, potentially. Potentially, but I think that if you look at conventional films, it's actually the sense of time in conventional films is very distorted. Um, I'm just doing it for a particular reason, so it's drawing attention to that fact. But I think in most films, the sense of time is incredibly distorted. You were talking about tropes in films, and there's one that was a big one for maybe, it seems like the entire 50s, which is using an amnesia victim. It's not amnesia. <laughs> and that's very important. Um, my brother and I, when we first talked about the idea, he made it very clear to me that the reason he was excited about the idea, and I totally shared this, is that it's not amnesia. So it's, it's a form of amnesia, but it's different from what we think of as amnesia. Um, and, and his point was that in an amnesia movie, there are no rules. Anything can be true. I mean, absolutely anything can be true. You know, the, the protagonist can be anything. He can be, you know, the killer. He can be this. He can be, you know, with no rhyme or reason. Um, it's too easy in a sense. There have been some good amnesia thrillers, but it is, it is a little bit easy. This is a much more controlled space that's blank in the guy's personality. And to me, it's a really interesting area because it's the area between the person you are now and the person you once were, all the objective information that you supposedly um, define yourself through, you know, your name, where you live, um, all this sort of stuff, um, your whole childhood, all that, that's all accessible to him. But it's the, di it's the difficulty of reconciling that with his present self. And that seemed to me to be a maybe just, you know, for somebody coming up on 30, it just seemed like a kind of interesting <laughs> arena. It's like, how do you define yourself as a person now? How do you sort of sit there and look at yourself and say, well, how did I get here? And, 
you know, who am I now, and you know, compared with what I was 15 years ago, for example. It seems an interesting area of the the uh, the personality to explore, really. But it also means, to some respect, you make this character kind of a blank slate, doesn't it? I mean, he becomes, in effect, the audience the audience surrogate. Yeah, which is one, I mean, very strong element of amnesia thrillers and of this type of, you know, memory loss thriller because um, the protagonist is, is, you know, an immediate figure of identification for the audience because the audience is, you know, sitting there wanting to find out, you know, what's going on and, and here is this, this figure wanting to find out what's going on. Um, and I think that was one of the things that really drew me to the, uh, the idea of the film, to the, to the story because I was very interested in telling a story um, that was so firmly from the point of view of one individual. And you have to find an actor, too, who's willing to do that kind of thing, who mm. is basically willing to walk around confused yes. for the better part of two hours. Yeah, definitely. And the um, guy was very happy to walk around confused. Uh, I mean, when I first met him, he... Um, I can't remember his exact words, but he said that the script had sort of, you know, spoken to something paranoid in his soul or something. And uh, he... Guy's interesting in that respect because he questions, he worries about his memory. You know, he, he questions his, his memory and, and worries that he forgets things and all the rest. The irony being that he has a fantastic memory. Um, I mean, absolutely fantastic. And, you know, all the while he's making this film about this guy who can't remember anything. I mean, he remembers everything he's done in every setup absolutely perfectly, um, which was such a help to us because we had to make the film very fast. We shot the whole thing in uh, 25 and a half days. And part of the reason we were able to do that is because Guy could repeat something he'd done exactly. So all the insert work, you know, all the close-ups of writing notes and this kind of thing, um, he did all that himself. Now, tell us a little bit about what Following is about. And it's a movie you shot over the course of a year, I guess, whenever money would come together. And... Yeah, yeah. Um, well, Following is a, it's a no-budget um, black-and-white 16 mil film that I made with um, friends of mine in London. Um, and we were all working full time uh, when we made it, so we could only shoot one day a week. We would get together on Saturdays and uh, shoot this film and shoot sort of 15 minutes of footage every week. And uh, it took about a year of uh, a year of filming to, to get it all finished. Um, and it's sort of a film noir, I guess you could call it. It's a um, psychological. I don't know if you'd call it a thriller exactly, but um, it's the, the story is this. Um, young man who's, who's lonely and on his own uh, in London where we shot it. And fancies himself a writer. Fancies himself a writer, but sort of clearly isn't doing too much writing. And, um, he takes to following people at random on, on the streets, you know, picking somebody out of a crowd uh, in the middle of London and, and following them to see where they go and what they do. And, and his justification, you know, for doing that is, is that he's, you know, researching his characters or sort of looking for inspiration for characters. Um, but it becomes clear pretty early on that, that he's just kind of addicted to it. You know, that kind of extension of his voyeurism um, has become a powerful draw. Um, and my notion with that narrative was to to tell a story that, that expands in, in three dimensions, um, the same way that I think we often receive stories in everyday life. Um, the example I like to use is, is when you're reading a newspaper report. You get the headline, you know, version of the story, you know, man bites dog or whatever, which tells you everything, basically. And then the story is expanding it in all directions, expanding your understanding of the detail. Um, and that's, that's the way the, the narrative structure of following um, works. What was the response to, to following from the you start getting calls from producers and actors who want to... I mean, did many people get a chance to see it? Yeah, I, a lot of people saw it um, just on, on tape. I mean, we were distributed um, through Zeitgeist in, in North America and various other territories in the world. So a lot of people got to see it theatrically and, uh, you know, festivals. Um, but also, I mean, in, in, in industry terms, um, you know, I was able to send out a lot of tapes and, and really get it to a lot of people. Um, the nice thing is it's a film that, unlike Memento, actually, it's a film that plays well on tape. Memento is, I think, a much better experience on the, on the big screen, but, but following actually plays pretty well on TV, I mean, not least because it, I shot it in Academy, so it actually fits the format, you know, better and all the rest. You've been to film festivals with both your pictures, with mm -hmm. Slam Dance, with Following, and Sundance, with Memento. What's, what's that like, taking the picture to a festival? It's, well, it's terrifying. 
first and foremost, um, particularly the first couple of times you do it. Um, but then with both of those films, we were, we were very lucky. We got good response from audiences. And the great thing about film festivals is, is that you have um, an audience who's, who's really looking for something different and looking for something different from the mainstream. And um, they come to your film, at the festivals I've been to, you know, the audiences come to your film to enjoy what you're doing. They're really giving you the benefit of the doubt as an audience, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, and it's very enjoyable as a filmmaker to, to experience screening a film to an audience like that. It can be a pretty rarefied world, obviously, because they come as real film lovers and maybe not as skeptical or jaundiced. Th you have to win them over less, I guess is what I'm asking. Is that yeah, true? no, I, I think that is true, um, at least to begin with, you know, in, in, in terms of they, they enter into the film, you know, in the f from the first frame, you know, with a, with a willingness to sort of go where you're going to take them and, and not um, be too sort of judgmental. Having said which, if you're screening at the end of the festival, you very often are screening for an audience of people who've seen, you know, 15 films in the last 10 days and they have a, a very sort of weary approach and sort of sit there kind of like, okay, here we go, is there going to be something in this? Um, but I mean, overall, my experience of the festivals has been wonderful, um, just really interested audiences and, and that's great. Uh, congratulations on a compelling and challenging film. Um, I'm interested about the way you work on the set. I mean, obviously storyboard and script and editing is essential to this film, but walking the actors through this complex atmosphere you've created seems key to the film's success. And I hear when you're on the set working with an actor, you are working right next to the lens of the camera and not where most directors are doing these days, behind a monitor. Well, I, I mean, in terms of what you're talking about, a working method, um, you know, as to using them, just watching things with your eyes instead of with the camera. I mean, my first film, I shot it myself, so I was seeing everything through the lens, not which is actually much clearer and sharper, you know, way of, of perceiving than, than on the monitor, um, because it couldn't afford any kind of video assist. So I'm not used to working with a monitor anyway. And then when we came to shoot Memento, I was very lucky to find um, a director of photography, Wally Fister, who's also a fantastic camera operator. So the purpose of looking at the monitor really, for me, is simply to check framings, because I'm not doing the camera myself. And the first take I, I watch Wally do, it's very clear that he's a much better cameraman than I am. So I didn't have to worry about that. Um, I think if you're making the film for the big screen, and you know, we shot this film in Cinemascope, um, and it has a very clear image, uh, and, and you project it very big, you see so much more in that image than you're ever going to see on a monitor. Um, so it's, it's a, an appalling way of trying to gauge acting, uh, you know, any kind so of subtleties. Well, I, you know, and maybe they're comfortable doing that. I mean, everybody's working method is different. But for me, I don't like to, to look at the monitor because the, the image is not, expressive enough. I mean, it's not clear enough. You really need to be by the camera watching the, the performer. And I don't like to use the headsets either because the sound is heavily compressed and it, it, it doesn't, you don't get as much of the voice as you're going to get when you, when you see it in a the theater. Um, so for me, it's just, to, it's simply the best way of getting a, an understanding of what you're actually recording on the film. Your uh, distributor must love you because people are going to have to see this two or three times I know I want to. I know I want to see it again. I mean, did you th actually think about that? Do you think people are going to gr grasp everything that? Um, they... Yeah. How cynical are you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I, I definitely thought about that, but not not you know for the purpose of trying to sell more tickets because I think that would be a pretty pretty stupid way of going about it. But um, <laughs> but I I love films that that you can come back to a second time or even a third time and get a slightly different experience whether that's just because of, um, I mean, in the case of somebody like Ridley Scott, he makes films that are cinematically incredibly dense, you know, in an audiovisual sense, so you can kind of see other things in them when you come back to them. Um, I wanted to do it in more of a narrative way, but I, but I love films that kind of will hold up to that scrutiny, um, particularly these days because you are seeing films two or three times. You know, you're seeing them in the cinema, then you're seeing them on video or on cable, and then you're catching them you know, on a plane somewhere or whatever. I mean, it, it's amazing to me the number of times you are seeing. Even movies you hate, you wind up seeing three times, you know. Um, so if you can make a film that, that um, 
actually does something a little bit different the second time you see it. To me, that's a fascinating thing. And that was um, very much on my mind in making this film, um, particularly because the, with this structure, you know, it's a continually developing um, story, you know, where you're reinterpreting everything you've seen throughout the movie and then at the end. Um, and so it seemed essential to me that it would hold up the scrutiny second time, um, but also give you a different experience, sort of be about slightly different things. Um, I guess I wonder too, because as this comes up, if there are pictures that are really touchstones for you, mm. that you brought that kind of experience or the experience has changed for you in seeing them two or three times, because it's clearly influenced the way you work. Mm. Hmm. I, I think when, uh, one of the ones I would mention from when I was a teenager was Angel Heart. Because that, that's a movie that, you know, Alan Parker made that, that has this incredible twist at the end that sort of changes everything you've seen. Um, and I was pretty fascinated. I can't remember how old I was when I first saw it, 16 or something. And um, you could go back and watch it again and be surprised that you hadn't noticed certain elements of the story that, that lead up to that ending. Um, so it was a film that took you by surprise, but that played fair with you. You know, and if you came back to it, you had a, had a rather different experience. Um, but I mean, I mean, more recently, you know, people talk a lot about, you know, the sixth sense or the usual suspects of films like this. Um, but I think, you know, there have often been interesting movies where the story surprises you at the end in some way um, or towards the end in some way that, that does make you rethink what you've, you've seen. In the case of Memento, I wasn't interested in sort of some kind of snapping twist at the end so much as a changing relationship with the, the central uh, central character um, a character that you start to basically distrust through the story and you start to question the, the things they're showing you the things they're telling you that seemed to me to be kind of an interesting interesting thing to play with very good point and let's thank chris Nolan for being here tonight thank you.